We've come to our last lesson in our study of a book for our times, a study of the book of Psalms. I want to here at the beginning give a little recap of where we've been in these last several weeks, and then we'll move forward in our last lesson here together. Can we imagine our Bible without the Psalms? That's the question we began with five weeks ago. Can we imagine the Bible without the Psalms? And I I pose that that is sort of like imagining the Bible without its heart, <laughs> that there's so much richness and so much that is central uh, to the Bible that we find in this wonderful book of the Psalms. And if we lost it, it, it would be gutted. Uh, the Bible would be gutted, when, and we would lose many memorable lines that strike a chord within us. We'd lose many lines that encapsulate our thoughts and our emotions to God, and further, we'd lose much of what ministers to us from this wonderful book of the Psalms and has opportunity to minister to us in a special way during the times in which we are living. So can we imagine our Bible without the Psalms? That's the question we began with. And then we moved on to talk about how the Psalms help us frame a response to God, uh, which, which enables the whole of our emotions and the whole of our experiences to have voice uh, to God. Uh, Calvin talked about the Psalms having uh, in them a sort of anatomy of the whole soul. And so as we study the Psalms, as we appropriate them, we are learning the variety of emotions of a Christian as we respond to God in our discipleship. And we looked uh, further in that first lesson on the nature of biblical poetry and how it is especially given to memorization into singing, and as we memorize the psalms and as we sing the songs, they take root within us and they become internalized. And I think we'll see today uh, in the second half of our lesson that that is especially helpful uh, as we think of the psalms in prayer because this is the prayer book of the Bible. And as we internalize the psalms, we are appropriating the psalms and then we can pray them back to God. So we did a lot of that uh, that I just recapped in the introduction. And then from the introduction, uh, Pastor Tom Grosma took us through Psalms of Lament and Psalms of Thanksgiving. And then last week, Dr. Kruger looked at Psalms of Praise. How can each of these types of psalms, because the, the book of Psalms is a diverse book with many different kinds of songs, how can those psalms in particular help us in our walk with God. What I want to do today is in c- conclude our study of this book for our times, the book of Psalms, by connecting the book of Psalms to Jesus Christ. How does Christ relate to the Psalms? And then transition to looking how might we utilize the Psalms in prayer. Let me pray for us and, and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for these past weeks looking at this wonderful book of the Psalms. We thank you for the gift the Psalm is in our life with you. Uh, You have used it so richly, starting with the authors themselves, uh, King David and others, but through the history of your church, this has been the prayer book of the Bible. And we pray that would be so for us. And we pray especially today you would teach us how our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ himself relates to this wonderful book and how we might utilize the the Psalms in our own prayer lives that we might grow in our relationship with you, that you might be glorified through us. And we do pray now that you would be glorified through this time together. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, the first point we are going to look at is Christ's relationship to the Psalms. And there's a few key New Testament passages which make clear that the Old Testament, of which the Psalms is a part, that the Old Testament relates to Christ. And that indeed Christ can be found through all of the Scripture, not just the Gospels, not just the Epistles and everything else found in the New Testament, but also in the Old Testament. This is actually what Christ himself taught. Let me... Uh, direct you to just a few passages uh, in your handout and on uh, the the screen there and the slides that you'll be able to see. I give you more than just a few passages. But uh, the first passage I want to look at you with is found at the end of Luke in chapter 
24, which is uh, called the On the Road to Emmaus passage, where Jesus is walking and he's talking with his disciples. And many have called this probably what we find here, the, the greatest Bible, Bible study ever, where Jesus himself is walking his followers through the scriptures and showing how they relate to him. I want to look at just two verses in chapter 24 with you, verses 27 and verse 44. In verse 27... It says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, and that's a reference simply to uh, the, the Old Testament. He, that is Christ, interpreted to them, that is those he was walking with on the road to Emmaus, in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Now, this is Luke. This is a gospel. And so, uh, this, this is talking about Jesus walking with his disciples before the New Testament was even written. It's recording something in Jesus' life. And as Jesus is referring to the scriptures at that time, he's referring to the Old Testament, to Moses and the prophets, and he's teaching them how they relate to him. And then if you look at verse 44 a little later, it says, uh, Then he said to them, this is a, a little later as Jesus appears to his disciples, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets, and then here it adds, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scripture. So he sees himself in his ministry, in his life, death, and resurrection, what he is doing as a fulfillment of everything that preceded him in Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. So Christ is found in all of the scriptures. All of the scriptures lead to him, and he is the fulfillment of the scripture. Another passage I want to look at you with is in the Gospel of John. We just looked at uh, the Gospel of Luke. But in Gospel of John, chapter 5, Jesus is interacting with the Pharisees. The Pharisees were well-known uh, Bible scholars. They knew their Bible. They knew their Old Testament very well. And listen to what Jesus says to them in John 5, 39. He says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they, that's the scriptures, that bear witness about me. Again, what is Jesus referring to as he is talking about the scriptures with the Pharisees? This is in the gospel of John. John is recording something that took place in the life of Jesus, and he, an apostle, uh, would have observed. That's the Old Testament. Jesus is talking about searching the scriptures of the Old Testament. Later in verse 44, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes only from God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. But if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me, Jesus Christ says. So both on the road to Emmaus, as he is talking to his disciples, and here in John 5, as he's talking to the Pharisees, Jesus is saying the Old Testament, the Word of God, the Scriptures as they were at that time, they talk about Jesus. He fulfills them. They all point to him. So for the purposes of our study, that includes the Psalms. That includes the Psalms. Let's think a little bit together of how the Psalms might connect to Jesus more specifically. We can take from these passages from Jesus. Yes, all the Old Testament directs us to Christ in some way, but specifically in what ways? Well, one way that the Psalms connects to Jesus, directs us to Jesus, is through the strong emphasis that we find in the book of Psalms on the Davidic kingship. David, of course, is the major author of the Psalms, and many of the themes that we find in the book of Psalms have to do with Davidic kingship. And if we understand Davidic kingship rightly, we understand that Jesus Christ comes as the son of David. Yes, he comes as the son of God, But he comes as the son of David, as the eternal Davidic king, as the one who fulfills all the promises that were made to David. So as much of the Psalms is taken up with the idea and the reality of kingship 
and David as central to the institution of the monarchy in Israel and all those promises that were given to David that are going to be fulfilled through his line, through his royal line. It is Jesus who comes and takes up the throne, as it were. Um, in, in the very first chapter of the New Testament makes that clear when it opens, uh, Matthew does, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So as much as the Psalms is taken up with the Davidic kingship, and Jesus himself is the son of David, and is the king of kings, and the Lord of lords, the fulfillment of monarchy and kingship that we find there in the Psalms is fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Another way that we see Christ through the Psalms is through something that we call typology, through something we call typology. Let me make just a few general comments about typology, point to sort of an example, and then give some explanations of what, what this concept of typology is. Even if you've never heard that word before of typology, I think once I begin to explain it, you, you will understand. You already know what I'm talking about because you've read, if you've read your Bibles over the years, you know and have seen this type of reality in the Scriptures. First of all, typology assumes the theological solidarity of all the Scriptures. That means that all the Scriptures interconnect with one another. Just like Jesus said that all the Scriptures speak to him, and uh, that he is the fulfillment of all of the scriptures. All the scriptures connect because ultimately all of the scriptures have one God and one author. Yes, it's a diverse book written many times by many authors, but over and above all those authors is ultimately one author who ensures through his providence and sovereignty that all of these scriptures connect and relate to an ultimate theme preeminently uh, found in Christ. So typology assumes this theological solidarity and interconnectedness of the scriptures tied to the fact that they're authored ultimately by one God. Well, there are place, there are, there are types. Again, this is a study of typology, so we're talking about types. There are types in places like the Psalms which find clear fulfillment in the New Testament through Christ. This is especially seen through kingship. I just mentioned how one way that we can see Christ uh, through the Psalms is through this theme and this reality and this institution of kingship that was established first uh, with David and the promises made through David. And there are many kingly types, royal types, that we find in the Psalms that find their fulfillment in Christ. Let me give you an example so you can see a little bit what I'm talking about. You can turn to Psalm 2, Psalm chapter 2, and then look at verse 8. In verse 8, it says this, Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. Now, what's interesting about that verse um, is that is a verse of, 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 of about uh, the king, and that is a verse about the king of Israel. But nowhere in Israel's history did a king rule to the ends of the earth, right? Under David and then the beginnings of Solomon, you have the full extent of the rule of the Israelite king. And at the time, it was impressive, but it certainly was not to the ends of the earth. So how do we make sense of such a universal claim of Psalm to eight. Well, one is to see it through uh, typology. So a type, to be a little more specific and to put some definition on it, is a person, an event, or an institution that serves as an example or pattern for later events, later persons, later institutions. Let me repeat that. A type, and it comes from the Greek word typos, T-Y-P-O-S, uh, a type is a person, event, or institution that serves as an example or pattern for a later event, person, or institution. In other words, God works in a certain way in the Old Testament through a type, such as the Davidic king, the royalty that was found in Israel, that, and he works through that in a foundational way, 
so that it sets up a fulfillment that is to come in the New Testament. And that fulfillment is called the antitype. So the type is in the Old Testament and the antitype is in the New Testament. The type is this institution, person, or event that awaits fulfillment and is going to be connected to some pattern that we find later. So here's the key. Typology is rooted in a view of history where God is under sovereign control of all things. So that what happens in the Old Testament anticipates the events that are going to be found in the New Testament where they're going to be fulfilled and God is sovereign over all, orchestrating all of this, unfolding all of this. And the reason that this is so in the scriptures is he's the ultimate author of all of this. He's working through all the minutia, all the details, all the historical contingencies, all the authors, and he is weaving together this beautiful picture of type and fulfillment, type and antitype. So in the Old Testament, in the development of the history of God's people, in the progress of revelation, we see a deepening of understanding as Scripture moves through some of these types and marches on to the fulfillment in the antitype. So there's a deepening that we have when we come to Christ to understanding a passage such as Psalm 2, verse Eight. Psalm 2, verse 8. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. No king in Israel ever fulfilled that fully, but the king to come, the king of kings and the lord of lords, indeed, he is the king of the Jews as well, he does fulfill this. The nations are his heritage and as he is consummating his kingdom, he does rule with the ends of the earth as his possession. So he's the great antitype to the type that is established in David. And he is the one that fulfills what we find in Psalm 2, 8. Now, Psalm 2, as you may know, is a messianic psalm. And there are other messianic psalms, such as Psalm 110, which have some very clear anticipation of the Messiah who is to come. But in other Psalms as well, you, you are going to find God is orienting his people to his covenant. He is orienting his people to his plan of salvation. And all his covenant promises and all the unfolding of his plan of salvation finds fulfillment in Christ. So it is no surprise that when you come to the New Testament, the Psalms are the most quoted book from the Old Testament. Let me say that again. When you come to the New Testament and you look for quotes of the Old Testament, what is going to be the most quoted book? You're going to find the Psalms quoted over and over again, including by Jesus Christ, including by Jesus Christ at some of his most crucial moments, even on the cross, as he cries out from Psalm 22 specifically. So it's the most quoted book from the Old Testament, the New Testament. And Jonathan Edwards, uh, the Amer great American theologian and preacher in his work, A History of the Work of Redemption, said this, the main subject of these songs, let's talk about the Psalms, is the glorious things of the gospel, as is, it, as is evident by the interpretation often put upon them and the use that is made of them in the New Testament. For there is no other book of the Old Testament that is so often quoted in the New Testament as the book of Psalms. Here Christ is spoken of in a multitude of songs. So Jonathan Edwards clearly saw this intimate connection between Jesus Christ in the Psalms and the Psalms due to the interpretation that the New Testament authors often gave to the Psalms, connecting them to Jesus Christ. So there's an intimate relationship between the person and the work of Jesus Christ in this wonderful book of the Psalms. Indeed, Jesus as Lord 
as one of the Trinity, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, is the object of worship that we find in the Psalms. So much of the Psalms is filled with worship, and so the Psalms are prayers of praise, songs of praise to Jesus. So there are prayers to Jesus, but they are also, we could say, prayers of Jesus. As I already mentioned, Jesus himself cried out from Psalm 22 on the cross. Prayers to Jesus and prayers of Jesus. So we've looked at a variety of ways that we can connect this wonderful book of the Psalms to Jesus Christ. Now in the second half of this lesson, I want to move from looking at Christ and his connection to the book of Psalms and make a case for utilizing the Psalms in our prayer life. I suppose one case has already been made. Christ himself utilized the Psalms. Even on the cross, as he cried out to God, he utilized Psalm 22. But I think for many of us, we struggle with this idea of using scripts or set prayers in our prayer life because we want our prayer life to be relational because we're talking to a God who is a, a person and who relates to us personally, and so we want there to be a conversational element in our prayer as much as possible, and, and, and that's something good to, to encourage. But God has also made us to, to use what he himself has inspired to pray back to him, and that's the way that the book of Psalms has been used throughout the church as a prayer book, as forms, as scripts that can inform our words and shape our words and our prayers as we pray back to God. Indeed, as I tried to make the case in the first week, as we uh, read the Psalms, as we internalize the Psalms, they have a way of framing our soul in a godly and a balanced way. And so that our emotions and our heart as we cry out to God in prayer will increasingly be formed by what is found in the Psalter itself, which is an anatomy of the soul, as, I, as Calvin put it. So as we come to the Psalms and we consider utilizing them in our prayer lives, we are considering utilizing pre-existing forms in our prayer and so I want to make a brief case for that. The first point in making a case for using forms in prayer is that we often find ourselves before God in prayer speechless. We often find ourselves speechless. If we're honest, prayer is difficult. We are praying to an absent person, and I use absent in quotes because we know he's present, but he's physically not there. So it's not like us having a conversation with one another where we might be in one's presence and see the other person and see how they are responding to us. The prayer is based on faith in what we cannot see. And it can be unnatural outside the spirit working in us to speak to a physically absent person. But I also think that in addition to that challenge, we, we also have seasons we have seasons in our spiritual life where we can seemingly spring forward seamlessly with words in prayer to God. But then we have seasons where, uh, see, seasons where there's a certain inertia uh, in, in with, with regard to our prayer life. Uh, the prayers of others can help us in both of these times. In times of plenty where prayer is coming rather natural to us. The prayers can guide and form ours, giving us those right priorities, those godly priorities, and focusing our prayers in a godly direction. When we are struggling in prayer, the prayers of others can give voice when our, voice, when our voices are silent. They can draw us from silence to communicating with God. In line with this, I believe reading others' prayers, including the, the Psalms, can actually teach us, and this point I tried to make in that first lesson, emotions and longings in our souls that we didn't even know we possessed because we had not given them adequate voice. So when we listen to the Psalms, to the, to the praises and the longings of those writers of the Psalms, including David, they, they begin to take root in our Hearts, and we find a voice there in our hearts that we might not have even heard and given voice to before. 
But I think when it comes right down to it, we are often at a loss in prayer when facing two opposite realities. When we face the grandeur of God or the awfulness of our sins. The grandeur of God or the awfulness of, of our sins. We want to enter into praise. We want to repent. But we often, in light of that, don't know where to start. And I think we see this with David. Um, I'm actually going to draw from David in 2 Samuel 7. So I'm going to take us out of the Psalter here. Uh, but I'm taking us to one of the great authors of the Psalter. In 2 Samuel 7, it's one of the high texts of the whole of the Old Testament because in 2 Samuel 7, God is showering down to David his promises and he's tying himself to David's kingship and his dynasty for how he is going to establish his plans and establish his redemption. Well, after God does that in the first half of 2 Samuel 7, David responds to God in the second half of 2 Samuel 7 in this great covenantal prayer. I want you to turn with me in that second half to verse 20. Um, it, pr just prior to this, all those pro great promises of God have been given to David in the Davidic covenant. And he stands, David stands, before God's great grace, before God's great condescension, and realizes that there's nothing in him that has prompted this in God. This all comes from the graciousness of God. It's not based on anything other than God and his grace. And this astounds him, just as it would astound you and me. And this is what we find him saying in verse 20. And what more can I, can David, say to you? What more can I say to you? And this is often our posture before God in prayer, is it not? where there's a certain speechlessness. But yet we seek to voice our longings and to praise God. And David, more than any other biblical author, has given us words to echo back to praise in God. So on the one hand, David here is, is, is expressing something that's very, I think, fundamental to us. He is awestruck at the grandeur of God, awestruck at his own uh, unworthiness to receive uh, these gracious promises, and so he's, he's at a point of speechlessness. What more can I say to you? But he does go on and say some wonderful things. This is what he continues to say in verse 20. For you know your servant, O Lord God, because of your promise and according to your own heart, you have brought about all this greatness to make your servant know it. Therefore, you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you, and there is no God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. So David starts with this sort of happy frustration of not having the right words to say in light of how wonderful God is and in light of him understanding his natural unworthiness. But, but there is an appropriateness to responding to this greatness of God and this grace of God. And so he moves into these words of praise as he does throughout the Psalms, right? Throughout the Psalms, wonderful words of praise that David himself offers. So, we long to pray. <laughs> and, 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 and even when we don't long to pray, uh, we are given words here in the Scriptures, especially in the Psalms, that we can use to give voice to those longings. What greater words are there than these very words by David themselves to give speech when we feel speechless, right? We are often speechless. The, the, the scriptures and the Psalms in particular, are, if I could use this phrase, they're like the gift of tongues. <laughs> they give us words to say when we don't know what to say in our prayers. That's the first point. Second point, we are often distracted. So we're often speechless, but we're often distracted as well. And praying scripture or using other prayers helps us overcome the challenge of distraction. It provides a sustainable pattern that cuts through sort of our frenetic lives and the distractions that often fill our minds when we are seeking 
to pray. And so the structure that you find in a scripted prayer and a written prayer, such as the ones we find in the Psalms, help focusing us, help focus us because they have an objective text. Rather than us sort of wandering in our own thoughts, there's an objective text there with words that guides what we are going to say. So structure provides a buffer for our own wandering thoughts. That's not to say we can't express our daily needs, you know, our specific needs that have come throughout the day, which aren't going to be there right in the text of Scripture in the Psalms. We can wrestle in our prayers due to the circumstances that we have in our lives. But forms such as the Psalms often help this freedom rather than constrain it. Because we can read about one of the circumstances that the psalmist is having and see our own circumstance mirrored in that circumstance. Certainly the details might be different, but we can see a mirror there because these are human beings just like we are. And through that form, through that uh, pattern that we find in the psalm, we, uh, our distraction is taken away from us and we find focus. So we're often speechless. We're often distracted. Third point in making a case for using forms, for using scripts, for using pre-existing uh, prayers like the Psalms is that we're often aimless. We're often aimless. Have you ever been helped by another Christian in his or her walk, right? So someone else's faith, someone else's walk, have you been helped by it in your own faith. And I'm sure every Christian listening to this would universally say yes. It's a parent maybe, a mentor, a friend, one who has provided you some picture of what it means to follow Christ. A picture that actually has room for you in it so that you can understand how you might follow Christ in light of that pic- uh, picture. Maybe for some of you, this has been through biography. You enjoy reading Christian biography, whether that's in Scripture itself, through the biography of David or through the biography of Ruth or, or someone in Christian history like Augustine or uh, Katerina von Bora. Some life, well-lived, oriented toward God that you've read about and has provided for you a um, picture of how you yourself might follow God as well. They teach us these, these stories, these realities, these teach us that we need other people. The Christian faith is inimical to a sort of radical individualism which says all we need is our Bible, our closet in Christ. No, we also need the body of Christ. We also need other examples of what it means to pursue Christ. So we stand with a great cloud of witnesses, both past and present. And this cloud has been given to us by God to encourage us as they witness to Christ and as they teach us his ways. I think one of the most exhilarating things is not necessarily reading the theology of some of the great figures from the past, but their prayers. Theology is great. I teach it after all. But, you, but reading their prayers, listening to their prayers, listening to the prayers of of those in the Psalms, what they help us do is in one sense kind of look into the engine room of the ship of their lives, right? If their life is a ship, looking into that engine room or looking into the, to the heart. David was described as a man after God's own heart and by entering into the Psalms, we get a picture of what his communion was like with God, his dependence, his praise, his lament, his thanksgiving, his petition. So when we learn to pray with those who have gone before us, including the writers of the Psalms, the same spirit who inspired their prayers can inspire ours. We learn to utter the the psalmist prayers as our own, to reiterate them in our own unique way through our circumstances. Only the Holy Spirit can teach us to pray, but the Holy Spirit is fond of using others to do that. He is most fond of using his word to do that. And if you remember one of the points we covered in the first week, the Psalms are especially given to appropriation, to putting them in our voice and in the midst of our lives. 
And so what I'm going to spend the rest of our time doing now is, is looking for some practical guidance, guiding us in some practical guidance of how we might appropriate the Psalms in our prayer life. So now some practical guidance on how we might pray the Psalms. Uh, the Psalms are a diverse book of prayers with many genres, and in fact, that was one of the uh, intentions in these past weeks to expose you to things like Psalms of Lament and Thanksgiving and hymns. And as you look at uh, your, your handout as it's made available uh, on the web, you can find that I give you many different types of psalms and sort of what are their governing concerns and what are some examples of those type of psalms and how they are structured. You, you went sort of in a deep dive with three types of psalms with Pastors Gros, Pastor Grossma and uh, Dr. Kruger with laments, thanksgivings, and hymns, but I give you some others, enthronement psalms, royal psalms, Zion psalms, wisdom psalms, trust psalms, Torah psalms. What are some of these types of psalms? Uh, what are their main concerns? How are they structured? So you can find those in your handout. Again, the book of Psalms is diverse. But how might you take those various diverse type of psalms and utilize them in your prayer lives? Here I want to give some practical guidance. The first and maybe most straightforward and obvious is a, ver a verbatim prayer to simply take what the psalm says through its verses and pray them back to God. Hymns which Dr. Kruger covered uh, last week. Hymns are especially given to this approach. Now, sometimes it might require a little reflection when praying, when there maybe are unfamiliar allusions, uh, historical references, maybe something doctrinally that, that we're grappling with. And so there might be need to be some study and using of a commentary to understand what is going on in a psalm, but a hymn can in many ways be prayed verbatim, word for word, back to God. Or you can take a part of a psalm and pray it back to God. One classic example of a hymn where you can simply take the words and pray them back to God is Psalm 8. I won't read the whole psalm, but I'll read those opening words, which I, I hope you can use in your own uh, prayer life. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And of course, the psalm ends with those same very words and filling in between uh, those two verses, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. There are many other words that we can appropriate and verbatim pray back to God. But I give you some examples. Psalm 8, Psalm 44, 51, 56, 57, 80, all different psalms that you word for word can use in your prayer life as you pray them back to God. Psalm 51 is one I've used often, and I'm sure many of you have used too, putting it in our own voice, a prayer of confession. It's, it comes from David's life after he realized his sin against Uriah and Bathsheba, a prayer of confession back to God. When we sin, a psalm that we can go back to and pray verbatim back to God, Psalm 51. So verbatim praying. That is one practical way that we can pray the psalms. But secondly, paraphrase pray, praying. Looking over a psalm and then paraphrasing it back to God in a way that's appropriate to the circumstances of your life. As I said, uh, the, these psalms come out of the variety of experiences of the writers themselves. Sometimes that will match up with ours, and sometimes it, it will not. But how can we read the psalms, see their similarities, and then paraphrase them in a prayer back to God? The wording might not fit your situation perfectly, but it brings something to your mind that you can easily paraphrase. You can read over what is in the psalm and form your own words and reflect on how you might pray it back to God. One example, if I could uh, give you an example of how to paraphrase prayer, would be from Psalm 59, if you want to turn there. Psalm 59, verse 1 through 4. Here, um, this is from David. 
Deliver me from my enemies, O my God. Protect me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from those who work evil and save me from bloodthirsty men. For behold, they lie in wait for my life. Fierce men stir up strife against me. For no transgression or sin of mine, O Lord. For no fault of mine, they run and make ready. Awake, come to meet me. And see. So David here is in the midst of, of enemies, which for him were often physical enemies, which were after him and, and his kingdom. And he's asking for the Lord's help. Well, given our circumstances uh, of many of us, I guess in the, the Western world at this moment in the 21st century, we might not face these sort of physical, imminent physical threats in the way David did. But we do know a variety of threats to our lives, including spiritual threats. And so maybe we read this and we don't feel like these circumstances match our own physical circumstances, but they may in many ways match circumstances of of verbal hatred towards us or certainly spiritual threats. And we do know we live in the midst of a world with many spiritual threats and in a spiritual world with many spiritual threats. And we can pray for God's protection in the midst of those threats. And that would, so that would be reading what this has to say and then paraphrasing it and praying it back to God in light of our circumstances. So verbatim praying, paraphrase praying. Number three, responsive praying. There are some Psalms which actually, as you read them, are not a direct prayer, but they do present a theme. They do present an idea or a situation that can be responded to in prayer. And what responsive praying establishes is a dialogue with God as he speaks to us in his word. We can respond in a way appropriate to our circumstances and needs in light of what he is saying in his word. A classic example of this in the Psalms would be Psalm 1. Of course, a favorite psalm of many uh, believers. Psalm 1 talks about the blessed person, the blessed man. And it it opens in these wonderful words, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. And, And there's much more, of course, richness in this psalm, but just there in the first couple verses, you have both the positive and the negative, the delight that uh, the blessed man is to express in the word of God, in the, in the law of God, and how uh, the blessed person meditates on that all the time. And then on what you're to avoid, and it even gives a progression of what you're to avoid, where you don't walk, you don't stand, you don't sit in the midst of unrighteousness. So you have the presentation there of an idea uh, that we can pray for in the midst of our own lives. We can respond to that and both pray that we wouldn't enter into that negative way and that the positive um, reflection on the law, on the word of God, and on pursuit of that would be manifest in our lives. And we can pray that for ourselves and we, of course, can pray that for others. So responsive praying, establishing a dialogue with God in light of an idea, in light of something he's establishing for his people in the word. So responsive praying. Fourthly, guided praying. This this is where we let the psalm guide us into prayers for ourselves or for others whose situation may closely parallel the psalm. And so what this allows is, is for the psalm to be a guide which, which leads into the direct uh, concerns of the psalms, but also might guide us away from what seem to be the direct concerns of the psalm. What, what, we're, what we're seeking to do in guided praying is the Holy Spirit using God's word to spark us, right? To pray for the pressing concerns of our life or someone else's lives. Um, Let me give you an example of something um, in this vein would be Psalm 67. Psalm 67 is a wonderful psalm um, about God's face shining upon us. Let me just read the whole thing. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all peoples praise you. 
Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. So this is a, a, a psalm that's often used in missions, and appropriately so, because it's a prayer for all people to worship God. But say you're, you yourself are facing persecution, or someone you know, some, maybe a missionary that you support or our church supports, um, they're facing persecution. How, how might this psalm be prayed for them? And so you can let this, this psalm guide your prayers for those who are facing challenges of those who, who uh, hate the people of God and hate God, that they would turn to God from hatred to praise, that God would shine their face upon them and soften them in their hard hearts. And then combination praying. As you master these approach, approaches, you can, uh, you can move from one to the other, from verbatim to paraphrase to, to responding to something, from from letting the psalm itself guide you into prayers for other peoples. So we've looked today at closing our study of a book for our times, the Psalms. We've looked at Christ and his relationship to this book. How do we connect the book of the Psalms to Christ? And then in that last point, we, we saw how Christ is really the object of the Psalms. And in, in, in so far as the Psalms address God and pray to God, he he, Jesus Christ, is the second person of the Trinity, so there are prayers to him. But Christ himself taught us uh, in his incarnate state to pray the Psalms, even as he did on the cross, praying Psalm 22. So in the second half of our lesson, we did look at some practical pointers of how we might learn to appropriate the Psalms in our own prayer life. I do commend you to look at the handout because there I do give the different genres of Psalms and how you might think through what are the governing concerns of those genres and some examples of those. So if you're looking to begin to pray some of the Psalms, hopefully you will find some jump start points uh, through the, the handout. But let me close this now in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this study in these last five weeks of the Psalter. We thank you for how much it speaks to the concerns of our time, both the highs and the lows. And we do pray that uh, we would learn through the book of Psalms for our own groanings, our own joys, to be more and more reflective of what we find among the authors of the Psalter. Because we know ultimately you, you, you inspired these authors. This is the only inspired prayer book. And so we pray that you would teach us to cohere and for our own prayers to be governed and shaped by these wonderful prayers. And I pray this lesson would be useful to that end, but I do pray all those that are hearing this would be prompted uh, through this overall study to, to make a constant companion of this book of the Psalms. And we pray that will be for the good and the growth of everyone in Christ and for your ultimate glory. Amen.